We hope you enjoy listening to this weekly podcast from Lifeline Church. Find out more by visiting lifelinechurch.co.uk. Good morning, everybody. It's a great privilege to be able to worship the Lord, whether we are in our car, walking along the road, before our Zoom screen, or even as we gathered uh, with the worship band here in Castle Point, wherever we are, that's our privilege. So we're going to continue this morning uh, on the second part of what is our reason for hope this Christmas. You remember last week we talked about having been on a, a journey where all roads took us, as it were, to the cliff edge, uh, reached the end of our ability uh, before we've ever reached our destination. Um, we see the chasm, you remember the little diagram? And we need someone bigger, better, more able to carry us from here. We need the Spirit of God. And the emphasis that God has been giving us at this time, uh, yes, very definitely about hope for Christmas, hope in Him. But the need for the Holy Spirit, the need for the refreshing of the Holy Spirit, whether it's to worship Him, whether it's to build and make supernatural, biblical friendships, whether it's to reach out to those that are outside, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the gift of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. So we decided really this is not about more teaching. And so in these weeks we've been taking time to wait on him and we'll do the same today because we continue to need him even as we in the worship wait on him and look for his outpouring and his anointing. So I felt that God this day, at this time, has a particular gift for a particular group of people, not to exclude everybody else, but I do want to focus on that. Whether you'd call that a burden or a direction, if you remember the story of the prodigal son, what an amazing story that was. When the prodigal returns, the father doesn't say, look, you've what a waster you are and what a scoundrel you've been and what a mess you've made of things and look, I gave you half of everything I had and what have you done, you've scorned. There was not a rebuke. There was welcome arms. There was the kiss. There was the recognition. There was a father that was waiting. See, God is not interested in reprimanding. He's interested in us being close to him and he has provided all that's necessary for us to come into a real, ongoing, fresh, refreshing relationship with him. So let me describe a little bit more what I'm thinking of. You might be somebody that's a faithful servant, but you're running on empty, not feeling hopeful, kind of feeling that others are passing by. You're keeping your head above water, maybe feeling a bit fragile, a bit downbeaten, you can hear good news, but the best you can do when you hear about what God's doing is, oh, yeah, that's nice. You can't really, really rejoice with it. I think it was something that uh, John Piper said. All you have is, in that sort of situation, is a decision for Christ, but not a delight in him. You don't really have the fullness of what Christ intends. You certainly don't have that refreshing of the Holy Spirit. You're not contemplating giving up on God, but you can't honestly say that you're delighting in Him and knowing what it means to have times of refreshing in His presence. You could probably, if we were to take a Bible story, you'd probably relate to the story of Mary and Martha. Occupied, doing things, maybe serving in different places. I would say preoccupied. But needing that Holy Ghost help, needing that thing that only God can do, needing that which you can't do yourself, to readjust the priorities. You know, the enemy wants to say, oh, it's a long, long 
hard, difficult, dusty journey to get back to that place. I remember being in a place like that, feeling it was like a long uphill climb. One day God came and I turned and realised he was there all the time. It wasn't about my ability to get back to him. It wasn't about my ability to access his presence. It was about my confession of need that I wanted something different. So my question is, are you going to be real? Are you going to just be preoccupied or satisfied? See, God speaks to the bruised reed, to the smoldering, smoldering wick, to those who are weary and are heavy laden. And he says, come to me. I asked Rosie if she would just minister this song to us. It's about coming to me. This could be prayer. This could be something that you could take a moment to identify with. You see, it's about a confession of need. That's a biblical principle. The principle of confession of need. Do you remember? Ask and it shall be given. Knock and it shall be opened. See, when Thomas, you remember Thomas? Still call him Doubting Thomas. When he missed out on the appearance of Jesus to the rest of the disciples. And Jesus and his mercy came again. He didn't turn to the disciples that had seen him. He turned to Thomas, who was honest and made that confession. He said, I know, I, I can't ride this on the back of what the others have experienced. This can only be, I, I gotta know for myself. It's, I've gotta have that personal touch that personal experience and instead of just confining himself to the others that were already in that place he came to Thomas and said Thomas here this is what God wants to do and I am the Lord your God and I go before you than your breath and I am with you wherever you go
to the right or to the left, keep your eyes on me. You will not be shaken, you will not be moved, oh. Cause I'm the hand to hold, I'm the truth, I'm the way, yeah. Just come to me, just come to me, cause I'm all that you need. That's a powerful song. What a powerful invitation. Come to me. I'm trusting that, that you'll hear God in this and hear this invitation. Just remember his promises. He said in, in Ezekiel, repeated in Hebrews, that he'd take my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh and a new spirit. We can't do this. This is the whole point. He does it. It's not about trying harder. This is what he does. See, what is stone? Stone's on the outside and it's looking in. Flesh, that's what beats with him. It likes what he does. You know, discontent can be the beginning of God stirring something, causing a desire for change. It's something that can take us to the next step. You know, we can be, can be good, but still they've got that hunger, that discontent, because we're meant to have that ongoing relationship being refreshed in the Holy Spirit. You know, disillusion <laughs> can be de becoming dissatisfied with your illusion. Change the heart of stone for a heart of flesh. Just ask the question, is it possible to change? And God saw something in his heart. He found that God was there. That principle again of confession of need. Do you remember we've had that phrase, uh, really coming from Jesus, only ever doing the things he saw his father doing. We tend to put it in, the, in our little phrase, you know, we tend to have that when it's raining, pray for rain. When we see God doing something, that's a time to get behind it. This is a time when God is at work amongst us. God is working around us, working in us. Isn't God good? We sometimes think it's got to be some kind of weird out-of-body experience. But there's Gary in an everyday thing. An expert saying there's nothing wrong with the brakes, but he just knew. Where did he know that from? God's goodness. And there's Richard. And in a moment of time, God just touches something that releases him in a new way. This is a time of encouragement. We've been asking reasons for hope this Christmas. And here's a, a spoken word that Charlotte has prepared along that lines. This year, as all the promise and shine of December hangs in the balance, I can see more clearly what's really at stake. We live in the shadow of 2020. Disappointment, loss, an empty bank account, lonely days, and lonelier evening. Sitting here, seeking the comfort of a distracting rectangular glow, we are given a brighter light, which redefines the shadows, a light that can't be put out, that stays with us in every dark place. A child who illuminates, opens my eyes to see, awakens my soul to hope. He is a light that dawns and promises. God is with us. Yeah, that's... That's our real basis of light. God is with us. We're given a light which redefines the shadows, puts them in their right place, a light that can't be put out. Oh, praise God, that stays with us in every dark place. This is an amazing place. This is our hope, a light that dawns and promises, that says God is with us. Praise his name. We want to continue to fan the flame, Stir up the gift. That's the thing that God's saying. The way we do that is we focus on him. And he enables us to do that. We're going to, in a little while, use that Christmas song that Carol, Hark the Herald Angel, sing. But before we do that, we've got four people who are going to share with us what that particularly means to them, what stands out to them in that. 
And as we do that, I don't want us to get caught up in some sort of familiar jingle, carol like that that we've sung. And I want us to enter into that. Focus on him. God is with us. So we're going to hear from Dave Simmons and then Heidi, then Charlotte and Dave Newman. My hope this Christmas comes from a couple of lines from the song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. What does that mean? I used to sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing a lot as a schoolboy when I was a young young kid. I was quite angelic, as you can imagine. Still am. Because it was the last song in the boarding school Christmas carol concert, I sang it with great gusto because I was about to see my parents again for the first time in three months or so and open some exciting new presents when I got home. But that line always struck me as a little strange. It's a bit like Shakespeare. You try and get your head around it. What is it talking about? Who are the sons of earth? What do you mean second birth? And then I gave my life to Jesus at the age of 19 and suddenly those words made sense. You see, Jesus did come as a baby and he was destined to die upon the cross. But, and this is a big but, he also came to destroy death. And he came to take us with him. So much desperation, anxiety, depression stems from a fear of death. When Nicodemus visited Jesus, he had to get his head around what it meant to be born again. And that's the uh, born to give them second birth part of that line. But when Martha and Mary came to Jesus weeping that their son, uh, their brother Lazarus had died, Jesus said to them, do you not believe I am the resurrection and the life? Whoever believes in me, even though he die, will live. I am the resurrection and the life. Think about that. We don't have to fear death any longer. He's already come to give a second birth, but also to raise us again with him, born to raise the sons of earth. That's my hope this Christmas. My reason for hope this Christmas is sparked from a line from Hark the Herald. Life and light to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Life and light um, speak of strength and vitality and hope to me. And there's that promise of healing And um, wings, throughout scripture, they they refer to a place of shelter, a place of protection, um, but also the strength of the wings of the eagle. Isaiah 40 reads, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Are you tired? Are you weary? Have you stumbled? I felt all these things. But what is my hope? My hope is in the Lord. I can take hold of his promise of shelter and protection and healing not in order to hide away, but in order to receive his strength and life and bring, and from that place bring his light and hope to those around me. I have always loved the song Hark the Herald Angels Sing, even as a child. And I remember being quite young and singing it and really not having much idea what most of the words meant. Um, but just enjoying the kind of joy of the song. And it was a couple of years ago that particularly the second verse hit me and I really started to understand and think about some of the lyrics. And the particular lines that struck me were Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. And it just sums up that idea that God himself made himself man so that he could redeem us. 
there's something about that word incarnate, which is quite an old fashioned word. Um, maybe not one we use very often, but for me, it's very evocative of the real life in the flesh that Jesus had to live, the real dangers to his life, the fact that he faced temptations just like us, that he would have been unwell, that he would have um, had to do all the things that we have to do to survive. And I think what strikes me in that is just the ultimate humility in that position that he loved us so much. He wasn't willing to just step in. He was willing to make himself like us and redeem our flesh from the way that we live in the flesh. And it's that pattern of humility that I want to be part of my life. And I just need to remember, and this song helps me remember, that that pattern of humility is one that Jesus demonstrates right through his life from being born in a manger up to the point of death on a cross and beyond. And that's how I want to live and how I want him to help me live, willing to give up my ease and comfort and status to serve and help people around me. My reason for hope this Christmas comes from a line from the carol Heart the Herald Angels Sing. The line is peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. The message of peace on earth was delivered to the shepherds in the field near Bethlehem when Jesus was born. They had two visits from angels. A single angel came and that terrified them and told them the good news of the Saviour, the Messiah, being born. Then the Bible says suddenly there was a multitude, an army of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those on whom his favour rests. The Bible teacher John Piper talks about it being sufficient for one angel to bring the good news of the birth of the Messiah. But the impact of that birth demands a multitude of angels to declare these two great outcomes. Glory to God in the highest through the birth of the child and everlasting peace on earth to those who receive him. And the offer of peace extends to everyone everywhere. But only those who receive the Messiah Jesus, who accept him and welcome him, can know and experience that peace. And of course, it's not just a, an ordinary bit of peace and quiet. It's a deep, all-encompassing, beyond understanding, supernatural peace with God, peace with one another and peace within ourselves. Every Christmas, when I hear or sing this carol, I'm reminded of this incredible offer of peace. And I'm so thankful to know the Prince of Peace and the peace of God in my life. So there we have some very real, inspirational thoughts. As we sing this, we're going to glorify God. We're going to speak of who he is and what he's done. We're going to fan the flame. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to make it real to us. Why don't you look to God for something to particularly stand out that could cause your heart to rejoice rather than just sing it as a well-known carol? Peter's going to lead us as we take this song. Thank you, Peter. Christ by highest 
For listening to this podcast by Lifeline Church. We hope this message has been an encouragement to you. We are a relational church with a passion to demonstrate God's love to one another and our surrounding community in real and practical ways. We believe that God has called us to have an impact on our families, our communities and our nation. We'd love to connect further with you so please do visit our website at lifelinechurch.co.uk on Facebook, lifeline.church.uk or Twitter at Lifeline UK.